Well, if Isaiah spoke of himself, and he suffered very much for being blunt and sincere in imparting God's message to his own co-religionists, if we think of Israel, which certainly is not unblemished, no prophet ever said that, but which suffered probably more than any other nation under the sun. And then Jesus, he did the same as a sort of microcosm of all of Israel. Then ultimately the message of all three interpretations means that God uh, welcomes the selfless sacrifice of luminaries unique in their generation and is prepared for that self-same sacrifice to uh, bestow forgiveness to a nation, a generation, a people, or a band of believers. Mm -hmm. And that unites the three interpretations. So I don't want that either or business the Greeks I love of. I'd rather prefer the one and the other as both possibilities of the ultimate meaning of this crucial chapter. But Dr. Lapid, when uh, our, we've got our lives on the line here, this is like going to a doctor and saying, well now, you have done an examination on me on cancer. Uh, and he says, well, there are three readings. Let's keep all three. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, it's a little risky. It's my life. I would like to know more precisely. Mm -hmm. And when we get to talking about the whole problem of uh, which was the great concern, I think, of the, the, of the Torah and of the prophets. It, it was the question of how do we get rid of the guilt and get rid of the sin question. This was one of the, the dominating themes here. Uh, the whole the sacrificial system was provided. Uh, uh, in poetry, yes, it is a picture, but it is a picture for what and where do we get the conclusion, the reality, the concrete? Uh, Hebrew, if it's anything, is uh, not abstract. It's very concrete. It, it, it's located in, in reality. And uh, the reality here, it seems to me, is that Isaiah 53 is trying to say, look, there is a, uh, uh, a person who will be that, uh, that uh, kipper, who will be that uh, one who ransoms, who delivers by a substitute. Mm -hmm. And uh, our only question, it seems to me, is the identity. Who then is that person? Will the servant of the Lord, who makes the perfect guilt offering, please sign in? Mm -hmm. uh, or please stand up? And in the fullness of time, here comes the, the Jew, Jesus, who marches in the history. And not with flamboyance, but as Isaiah 42 says, uh, 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 without making a big fuss, and, and yet uh, ministering, healing the sick, and helping those who are blind, giving them sight, and proclaiming the day of the Lord. The package begins to fit. If we use a pragmatic test for truth, there's a lot here that begins mm. to start fitting. And therefore, uh, I'm, I'm impressed by that. I think it's my culture. I think it's Western mentality that teaches me that there is a... Uh, uh, in the Hegelian pattern. You don't need to be dialectic, yes or no, true or false. You can make a synthesis, a kind of uh, mm. gray in between. And I think that's, that's German thought uh, with uh, all due respect to the, the great Hegel. Uh, Let me show you how un-German this idea is. <laughs> uh, at the Sinai um, uh, self-revelation of God, the central faith experience of Judaism. Yes. It says that the voice of God spoke to the people, and then come the Ten Commandments. And then comes the awkward sentence, and the people heard the voices and trembled. And the rabbis ponder upon the plural of voices when five lines before it only spoke of the voice of God. Mm -hmm. The result some five centuries before Jesus was the following. God spoke with one single voice, but each one of the 600,000 Israelites standing at the, uh, the foot of the mountain heard God's voice in his own inimitable individuality 
with the kind of ears, eyes, and brain God had given to him and nobody else. Mm -hmm. And he therefore got 600,000 different hearings, understandings, and exegesis of the one single voice of God. Mm -hmm. And I have a suspicion you got one interpretation because your ears and mine are different, and they ought to be, because God doesn't produce mass production. Every bearer of his image is totally unique and inimitable. Mm -hmm. And therefore, your reading of Isaiah 53 and my reading of Isaiah 53 are both reflections or refractions of the divine light. I don't believe in either or at all. I do believe in the multiplicity of interpretation, and I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. Because botany, zoology, astronomy, biology, and all these are books of God just like our Bible. No one basic law. The endless and inexhaustible multiplicity and variety, because no two fishes in a pond are the same. Siamese twins are anatomically different. Why on earth should in theology, of all places, Prussian uniformism prevail if it doesn't in all other books of God? I can give you one book of God, and that would be a chemistry periodical chart. If I go into the chem lab and say, well, I'll tell you what speaks to me, a little of this and a little of that. I may have truth uh, manifested to me in a tremendous way. You have a great <laughs> explosion there. I, I can't violate the basic laws of the universe and say, yeah, but that's what I get out of it. That's what turns me on. That's what's my bag. <laughs> I'll answer that, uh, Mr. Kaiser. We, it's a good point you made. My uh, revered teacher, Martin Buber, used to say, in sciences, a clear, uh, right, correct statement is the opposite of a false statement. In theology, one uh, clear truth might be the opposite of another clear truth. And there is no right and false easily discernible to our small human brain. Truths might complement each other, although at first blush they seem to contradict each other. Dr. Lapid, would you say that is true of the mind of God, though? I, I have lots of doubts about my interpretation. I suspect my interpretation of what? I suspect as much my colleagues' interpretations. But I really wonder whether God says, well, take it on an average. Uh, you know, I'll take the ten best interpretations. I don't think that's what he was about when he was trying to, if there is such a thing as a living God, and if he is truth in and of himself, I would think he does hold us accountable in theology just as much as he holds the chemist accountable to the basic periodic chart. And that's my, uh, that's ground Okay, final, final wrap up from both of you here, about 30 seconds. Well, let me say this. If we are frank, Dr. Kaiser, what we both know of God goes easily on a postcard with space enough left for three stamps. <laughs> no, it goes on 66 books. Uh, no, no, that's a different <laughs> knowledge. I would distinguish between what we know of God and what we know about God. What we know of God is rationally, scientifically provable, and that's nil as far as God is concerned, because he remains the inscrutable and unfathomable. What we know about God from secondary and third sources to wit, our Holy Scripture, our ancestors, yours and mine, and far be it for, to belittle these things, 